Gospel music is more than just a style of singing. In fact, for some people, it's a way of life. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels, and I'm the host of a new series that's guaranteed to lift the spirits of anyone who sees it. It's more than the music. And when I was seven years old, my brother Doyle, who was eight years older than I was, got a little mandolin and he started playing this mandolin singing and so I joined him in singing. We started singing duets together then. In churches and schools we sang duets together, gospel songs and uh, old folk uh, country songs. James' Christian mother was determined not to let their poverty get in the way of her boy's future. Tuition for singing school was three dollars and that was a huge sum to a family living hand to mouth but she sold some of her chickens and gave young James and his older brother Doyle a chance for a better life. The man teaching at, his, teaching at his school, his name was Vardaman Ray. He taught us the do re mis and the shape notes and gave us ear training. Once they got a taste of, of singing school, and they, they, I think James and, and my father discovered that's what they wanted to do. They loved it. They brought a wave into gospel music that gospel music had not seen in my lifetime. The Blackwood Brothers were so great with their harmonies and technically singing. The Blackwood Brothers were unparalleled. Family harmonies and family groups uh, can never be gotten around when it, when it comes to singing. And the Lord gave them the, the built-in harmonies. Each drop of blood, blood me on me on me. I was always impressed by the way James Black would handle himself. I thought he was a perfect gentleman. And I thought on stage he carried class. And you could, you could feel when the Spirit of God would take over, you could just feel it lift the audience. It takes a special wife, special woman to, to uh, Stay, to stay behind, to raise the family, a lot of times almost single-handedly. I knew she wasn't um, like everybody else's mom. She um, managed everything very well. My mom is a hard worker, incredibly faithful. When my dad came home, she was very much a servant to him. She, she understood that what he did, while it was very rewarding, what it was what God had called him to do, there was still a great price he paid to do that. And, uh, and she was so supportive of him. I think he not went overboard, but made sure that, well, maybe even sometimes did go overboard, just to, you know, just to really minister to her in ways that were tangible to her that said, I really appreciate your sacrifice. His first love was gospel music. He never lost his love for that. In fact, I remember as a, as a kid, sometimes he'd call the house and if my dad was there, he'd, he'd say, can you get the guys together? Can y'all come out and sing? And, and my dad would call the guys and, and they'd go out to, to Graceland. But Elvis Presley was a Christian. I know for a fact he accepted Jesus Christ as a savior. Cecil told me later that, uh, that he and Elvis went to the same little church and that they wa walked down and professed faith the same morning together. Well, the Blackwood Brothers started the National Quartet Convention in Memphis in 1957. And at all of the early conventions, probably for the, for the, the first 10 years or more, Elvis uh, came to almost every one. Elvis was a big fan of theirs. Would come to the concerts in Memphis, and then later when he, uh, you know, obviously hit the big time, uh, maintained those relationships with, with Daddy and J.D. We'd be backstage in our concerts and the door would swing open and here Elvis would come in with a, all of his friends and girlfriend and uh, they would sit backstage. And from time to time, we would introduce him and the crowd would go crazy. You know, Elvis was a huge 
uh, connection with his mother. Everything was his mother. If his mother liked it, he liked it. And his mother liked the Blackwood Brothers. I remember when his mother passed away, he called me and said, uh, said, you're my mama's favorite singers. Would you sing for a funeral? I said, of course. So we sang that day for his precious funeral. We ended up singing 10 or 12 of Gladys's favorite hymns. By the 50s, over half of all American families owned a television set, and the Blackwood Brothers made history by becoming the first gospel group ever to appear on national television, winning first place on one of the era's most popular shows, Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. For people who, aren't, who don't, don't go back that far, uh, before the days of 200 television stations, there were two or three. And Mr. Godfrey, had he was on the air probably more than any other uh, personality on radio and television. I remember sitting there watching that show, we finally had television, and uh, all of a sudden, Arthur Godfrey announces the Blackwood Brothers from Memphis, Tennessee. And I was just in a state of shock. Then when they announced the Blackwood Brothers, my heart was beating extra heavy, you know, because there's the family on nationwide TV. After the show was over, they had gone down to New York City to walk around and see the sights. And hear people in New York just hollering, tooting the horns at them. People would say, hey, there's the Godfrey winners. That's the ones that won the show. That's the Blackwood Brothers. He waved at me as he left, and I watched him as he went down that park, I just stood there with my glove and my ball. And uh, I had this, I don't know what, why, but I just had a strange feeling. Didn't know why, but I watched him till the car disappeared. So I went on playing my ball game. And uh, the ball game was almost over. And that was back in the days when they didn't have the laws and rules against buzzing the town with a plane or something. People did it all the time. Well, here I saw the, this plane coming. Of course, I looked up and saw a daddy. And he flew down like that and dipped his wing at me, like that. And when, he, when the plane went over, I could see him looking out. I could see just a part of his head. And they took the plane back and went and did like that. And the last time I ever saw him. 46 years. And I still not over. The plexiglass canopy had been shattered and was gone. And RW, I could see him still strapped in his seat with his head over like this. I never saw Bill Lyles. But I started in through the, the fire, started in toward RW. Someone grabbed me from behind and held me. I, I remember trying to get away and they wouldn't let me away. It, Jake Hess of the Statesman Quartet wrestled James to the ground, saving him from certain death. I didn't even know what I was doing going into that fire. It would have killed me if I'd gone in there. Resolving to honor the memory of R.W. and Bill, James finally agreed to perform again. The Blackwood Brothers Quartet was reborn, with J.D. Sumner singing bass and James' nephew Cecil Blackwood as baritone. Their first concert together was scheduled for Clanton, Alabama, the site of the plane crash. This was about a, a month and a half after the plane crash, and right back to the airport hangar, we did a concert without even rehearsal. Bill Shaw, James Blackwood, Cecil Blackwood, J.D. Sumner, Jackie Marshall to the piano, and that started our career back up there at the airport with several thousand people there to hear us, and Elaine Blackwood, R.W.'s widow, Ruth Lyles, Bill Lyles' widow, they were there and the kids, we introduced them. But I remember being there, I remember them introducing Cecil, but I think the one that got me the most was J.D. Sumner. All I know is I saw a guy just stand up, look like he looked like he went all the way to the top of the mountain, as big as he was. J.D. Sumner built a bridge that night to R.W.'s son, Ron, establishing a loving bond that would last for the rest of his life. We didn't actually know that he was involved in, in drugs until one night he was busted for drugs here, possession in, in Memphis. 
and he uh, he didn't want to call us, uh, but he called Jimmy, and of course Jimmy called us. We went went down to the city jail, and that was um, one of the worst nights my wife and I, I suppose ever spent us to go in and see our baby behind bars. My mom and dad came down to uh, to the jail, like, I don't know, some ungodly hour of the morning. And they were obviously crushed, just heartbroken. When they turned to leave after we'd visited for a while, my mom said, uh, your mom and dad love you. That's my mom and dad. It doesn't say, it didn't say we approve of what you've done. We didn't, they didn't say, well, you should have done this or you should have done that. But we love you and we're with you. That's what, our, that's what kept our family together. You know, I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, that I have such a healthy image of God. Because it doesn't matter how badly I've behaved or performed or how much I've disappointed them. Uh, I've never for one moment doubted their love for me. That's probably the point that I started turning around. We, we prayed for him during all of this time, just, just prayed that God would uh, reach him, whatever it took to reach him. And I, we felt that our prayers certainly were, were answered. And they took one look at me and wouldn't let me in the waiting room with the sick people. I was that bad looking just to walk in. Uh, they put me in a little isolation room and the doctor said, we're putting you in the hospital right now. We think you've got hepatitis. And so they put me in the hospital and began running the test. This was on a Friday, I believe. And they started with blood tests, and then they had arranged the x-rays, and then uh, I think the Monday was the CAT scan. He was so weak by then he couldn't even suck water through a straw. It's almost like life was slipping away. And I don't know, it wasn't an out-of-body kind of experience. It just felt like I was just getting to the point of just sinking so much deep into the, into the bed, the hospital bed, that I would just fall right through it. When nobody would touch me, nobody, they were scared of me. Uh, I was an outcast, and I understand. I, I, I don't blame them, I understand. But I was seeking forgiveness, that's all. I Just give me a chance. J.D. Summer was a real man of God. Because he reached out to me when I needed so bad. I got out of prison in Texarkana, Texas. I got on a bus and rode to Knoxville, Tennessee. Got there at four in the morning, did not even know but one thing I was gonna get there. And J.D. told me he'd give me a job. That's all I knew. Didn't know how much money or nothing. I got off the bus and at four in the morning, there stood J.D. Sullivan. Nothing's more beautiful than a good old gospel song. And that's why I'm so proud to be a part of a series that brings these spiritual melodies to life. These are the true stories of the singers and songwriters who use their gifts to spread God's message all over the world. It's more than the music, it's a calling. And we'd like to share it with you.